Father, Lord, uh, truly, you never let go. Uh, what, a, what a gift it is that we have uh, the opportunity to worship uh, such a loving and holy and, and glorious God. And Father, as we consider your word today, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, uh, the Holy Spirit, who would be active in this place, drawing us closer to you uh, through your word. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have to sit today. I, uh, for those of you that know, I started playing football, and I, I hurt my foot chasing giant men around the football field. Um, I am by far, actually I think I'm the second shortest guy on the team, and one of the smallest. And so I, I hurt my foot, so I'll be sitting today, which will be different, um, and we'll see how this goes. Um, I know Sonny sits and he does a fairly good job at it, but I'm kind of lost if I'm not wandering around. And so uh, we'll, we'll try this out today. If I like it, maybe we'll make a thing of it. Uh, because I get tired. I, run, I walk at least three miles a sermon. So um, Today we're going to consider uh, Paul's writing to the Romans as we continue on in our, our uh, walk through the book of Romans. We find ourselves in chapter 11, but I, I was reminded of a, of a time when my wife and I, uh, we purchased our first home, and this goes back to I think 2001. Uh, we actually, we were building a home. It was a small house, a little, little rancher, and in the process of that, uh, the, the builder said, okay, go down to this carpet store, you've got to pick out your carpet. And we went in, and, and there was all these options for us, and whatever we wanted was what we got, and that's what they put in. Well, it was, I contrast that with our, our current home that we live in. When we got in, it had white carpets, and we said, this will not do. And so promptly within you know, a couple of years, we said, we have to redo some of these carpets. Well, we didn't want to go to the carpet store, so we went to the remnant store. And at the remnant store, we walked in, and I don't know if you've ever been there. I'd never been to a remnant store. Uh, you walk in, and there's all these rolls of abandoned carpets. It's a very sad thing if you're a carpet. If you find yourself at the remnant store, you're stacked up with all the other remnants, and there's a label on you that there's only this much of you. And, and what you find at the remnant store is there's only a certain amount of each remnant. And if there's not enough, you're out of luck. Well, thankfully, we found the right remnant for us, and it fit, and it was just right, and we gave this carpet a home. Well, God talks about remnants in the Bible, and, but when God talks about remnants, it's never the leftovers. It's the chosen ones, and there's quite a difference in, in our, my view and experience of what a remnant is and what God's view of what a remnant is, and we're going to address that today as we consider what Paul writes uh, to the Roman church in chapter 11 here. So we'll go through the entirety, of it. we'll go through all the way down to chapter 11, uh, verse 24. We're going to start off, we'll break this off into chunks, we're going to start off with the first 10 verses. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me uh, to Romans 11, beginning in verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, and they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept my, for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed a knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a, a spirit of stupor, and eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. And let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and bend their backs forever. So we'll, we'll stop there and kind of make sense of, of some of what's going on. It, it's interesting to me to think that God... In dealing and speaking of God's people, that God has to preserve a remnant. It's almost, for me, it's counterintuitive to think, well, these are God's people. Of course they're all there. But we have to, for me, it comes down to, we have to ask the question, why in the world does God need a remnant? Shouldn't they all be following? Well, there's, I've come up with about five reasons why I think, uh, realistically, when we look at this, there's a necessity for a remnant when we speak of God's people. We're going to be speaking primarily of the nation of Israel as we're, as we're considering this, but I... I think we can also look at this in terms of the body of Christ as we see it specifically in the West and how things are going here. And so we look at this, I want us to kind of make sense of, of really what happens that God has to be able to say, specifically here to Elijah, I have a remnant of 7,000. 
Why, what puts God in that position? Why is, why is it that the nation of Israel has missed the Messiah? And Paul here identifies there's a remnant of people that are elect. So it starts off with, I, I believe that there's this notion when God's people quit hearing God. And, and it, it, they, they start to ignore, either ignore what it is that God has said, or they turn, and what I think is more tragic, is they challenge the credibility of those messengers that God has sent. Or, in our case, they challenge the credibility of the Word of God. Now, there's two frameworks here. If, if, we, if we look at people ignoring uh, what God is doing, it, when, when people are ignoring what God's doing, there's a couple things at work here. First off, uh, there's an active re- removal in saying, I, I just don't want to hear what God is saying. There's an active part in there that says, I, I, I don't want to hear it, I'm, I'm not going to listen. And, and many of us, if you have children, have experienced this very thing of a child saying actively in their head, I'm not listening. And it, 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 for a parent, in my house that doesn't work because I get louder and louder until I'm right in their face. Now it's funny with my daughter because of my children, my oldest daughter has been the one that could ignore me. Even if I'm in her face and making and doing funny things, she will just sit there. And it drives me nuts. Because she is, she's the only one they do. My sons, they say, I get about this far, especially the red-headed ones. I just have to look at them. Ah, ha, 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 Dad. But my daughter, she'll sit there stone-faced. And she will be laughing inside because I can't get her to, to give in. And so it's, it's one of those things where she actively chooses to ignore me. And she's quite adept at it. And we see that with God's people. There are oftentimes, even in our own lives, where we actively choose. I know what God is saying about this. But I'm going to ignore what he says because I'm going to do something else or, or one of any, any number of different things. But then there's this other notion where it is really attacking the credibility. And we see this a lot when it comes down to the Word of God. People will attack the credibility. If you understand, one thing that I don't know that most Christians know, the Bible has been attacked from the beginning. All the way through. And it's the only book to withstand every attack. And, and it's one of those things where we look at it and there's nothing, no new critiques coming out that haven't already been said. And yet they continue to throw these critiques out and the Bible continues to per- persevere. And pre- why? Because it's the Word of God. But there's these attacks on credibility and oftentimes Christians, when we want to hear something different, will say, well, maybe this is true. And I know of a pastor who no longer is a pastor. Um, he, had, he had enough sense to, to actually get out of the pastor. There are other pastors who uh, fall into this and don't. But he started to disbelieve in the inerrancy of Scripture. And he had enough, enough wherewithal to tell his, his elders, I don't think I can pastor this church anymore. But there are a lot of others who go on and, and continue this. I, 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 just, I, I listen to the critiques and I don't look at the reality of what's in the Word of God. But this is a, one of the first steps of people turning away, of God's people turning and walking away as they quit listening. The next step, or, or another step, is they stop seeing what God is doing. And this is fascinating to me because I, I look at this and, and I'm going to equate this to the reality of, of when we're looking at nature. If, if you've been here at Crossroads any length of time, you know uh, one of the things I love to, I, I enjoy looking at is nature because it testifies to the glory of God. And so we, we think of this in terms of I don't want to see God's hand at work. And I can lay out the data and the information and it's all there and we all are looking at the same thing. And if I choose that I don't want to listen to it or don't want to see it, I'll come up with some alternative. Not prevalent, that is, for when God's people look at that and say, well, I don't want to see God's hand at work. I don't want to see the beauty of God, the glory of God. I want another reason not to believe. I need something else here. And there's an active and a willing or willing, a bill, a willingness to deny the truth of what's there in, and within the data. So we look at the same data, but we come up with a different interpretation. And it, and it turns into where there's this actual, I, I had an interesting encounter um, if well, if you've ever had encounters with with folks you can, that are atheistic in their beliefs, um, oftentimes you can present the data and we'll look at the same data. I, I love to look at the eyeball, and and how how would this evolve? It, well, it can't because all the parts of the eye have to be functioning together in order for the and this the world is made up of several, thousands of, of creatures that, that are like this. But I think it's the Bombardier beetle. If you were here when I spoke of that, the fascinating thing about the Bombardier beetle is it, is its its rear end blows up, and it shoots it away. Now, if that, that, there's no way for that to possibly uh, evolve or come up. It's, everything has to do with these two mixtures of chemicals, and if that's not just right, boom, the beetle will blow up. But well, what does it do? 
blows it away and, and it shoots it away from its, whatever it's trying to get it. And there's all this data that we look at and we, we have to look at and say, this is fascinating how God has designed all this, but we have the same data and there's a willful ignorance or a willful denial. I don't want to believe that. And so when people start to turn away, and, and even God's people start to look at the data and say, you know, maybe it's something different. And then we, we get to the third point, which is, maybe God really just doesn't care. Maybe God doesn't care about all of this. Maybe God doesn't care that I'm doing these things. That God has bigger fish to fry than whether or not I'm cheating on my taxes. God has bigger fish to fry than, than whether or not I'm looking up things I ought not to be looking at in, uh, in, on the internet. God has bigger fish to fry than whether or not I go to the bar tonight. God really doesn't care about all these little things. And I'm here to tell you, God does care. He cares big time about the little things. I have a fascinating thing, specifically about football. Um, we were supposed to have practice last Saturday. And those of you who know, I wasn't here uh, last Saturday or Sunday. I was out teaching a marriage retreat for the military. And, and I was gone, and I wasn't going to make it to practice. And I'm, I was struggling with this, because I'm not very good, to just be honest with you. I, I, I haven't played since the eighth grade, and here I am going out there 38 years old, and there's these guys that have played for 20 years. Some of them are just out of high school. Some of them are just out of college. These guys have been playing. I, I can't miss practice. And so I'm struggling with this as I'm there, and I'm at this retreat with my wife, and I told her I'm not going to go. Uh, I'll stay here because I really kind of need to be here to do this. And I'm on the internet, I get a note to say practice is canceled. Something came up for the, uh, the team that uses the facility. It's the, the shocks facility that they allow us to use. Something came up for them. We can't have the facility. We have to do it tomorrow night. Now God doesn't care about football. But God cares about me. And I was struggling. I had prayed. My wife had prayed about this. And this is a, let's be realistic. This is kind of an insignificant. If I don't make the football practice, the world's not going to end. In fact, it might be better off if I don't. But really, we look at this, and the interpretation is, God, thank you. Because my mind went at ease. I was able to teach the classes much better than I would have otherwise. And I was much better capable of enjoying the time with my wife. And so we look at this in terms of the reality of God cares about all these little things. He cares about every hair on your head. He cared while he was knitting you together in your mother's womb. God cares about all of these small things in our lives. But oftentimes we, we fall into the trap of thinking, well, God doesn't really care about this little stuff for me. God doesn't really care about these, these little, these things are just insignificant. I can take care of this one, God. And, and we fall into this trap. And, and that's one of the beginning processes of when God's people start to turn away is when we start to think he doesn't care about this stuff. As we press on, a couple more things here uh, when we look at this. is when we get to this point, I, I look at us and, and often will say, at this point, it's dangerous. Because if, I, if I'm not listening to God, I'm not seeing God's hand at work, and I'm thinking God doesn't care, I'm going to start looking for people to tell me what it is I want to hear. And that's dangerous when God's people do it. it one of the things, and I, I know I said this a couple weeks ago in a sermon, but one of the things that's interesting about preachers is I don't get to tell you what you want to hear. I get to tell you what God says you need to hear. And, and that's, there are times when that's difficult. Because sometimes we're getting it. If you remember when we went through the book of Joshua. And God's throwing snowballs and killing people. And we look at this. This is a hard thing to preach. How do we do this? And we'll talk about that here in a moment again. But, but these are they're difficult things. But why do we, what do we do? We have, there are times when what I want to hear is not what I need to hear. And what I want to hear will always, almost, almost always be fleshly. And I'll seek after what do my itching ears want to hear. And when God's people start doing that, you start getting, I, I refer to them as watered down uh, sermons because that's what the people want to hear. I uh, Hopefully you don't hear that here. Um, maybe you will. I don't know. But, but really what we look at here is there's this desire. Just tell me that I'm an okay person. Tell me it's going to be okay for me if I continue on in this sin and I continue in this. And, and just let me know that God will forgive me. Just talk to me about the forgiveness of God. Don't mention God's justice. I don't want to hear that. And so we start seeing this, this desire, or this, this willingness to, I'm going to grab on to other things. And then but God's people always end up with a prostitution problem. And, and we speak of the nation of Israel, it's easy for us to see that. God calls them a prostitute. He has a whole book uh, where he has a, a prophet marry a prostitute. Just so he can text, tell Israel, look, you're a prostitute. And we, look at, and we look at Israel and say, you prostitute. And we fail to attribute that to ourselves. One of the interesting things with the body of Christ is oftentimes we duplicate what the nation of Israel has already done. 
We aren't Israel, by the way. We're the church. We're the body of Christ. Israel's Israel. You see that by the end of the sermon today. But God, God's people always have a prostitution problem. When we get to this point, we start serving other gods. We start looking at other things and saying, you know, their God looks fun. That looks like it's fun. Now, I will be honest with you. I had, those of you that know me, I've spoken of this before, I've had a, I had a problem with alcohol, I, it's an ongoing thing, I, it, it, fascinatingly, I haven't drank in years, but you know what happens when I get under extreme stress? I'd like to have a beer. I could make this stop immediately. And, but what, what's fascinating is the way that gets set into motion, is the reality of it was, the lie on the front end was, this will be fun. And it was. And that's... And that's how that starts, is, is we start looking at this and saying, you know what, serving God, hey, maybe doing this other thing, this will be fun. And we fail to read the fine print and realize there's a price for that. One of the things that the nation of Israel turned and began to uh, worship was Molech. And we find what they were doing was offering their children on the altar of Molech, burning them alive. And we, we also find them prostituting themselves out and, and sleeping with temple priestesses in prostitution, serving and seeking after these other gods because there'd be more pleasure, this fleshly desire to do this. And I just want to be like everybody else. Unfortunately for the church, we're not like everybody else. I say unfortunately, the reality is it's very fortunate that we're not like everybody else. God has called us to be holy as he is holy. The same thing he's stated to the nation of Israel. But just like them, oftentimes we have this same problem. But what's inter interesting when we look at the history and we understand what God's talking about when we speak of God's remnant, God always preserves a remnant. And Paul speaks of this notion when we look at this in terms of recognizing what's going on for Elijah. And I'll, I'll just speak briefly to this. This is back in 1 Kings. If you don't know the story, Elijah has just defeated the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. And it's fascinating because he defeats them and then the, he kills them all, which is, which is quite interesting. And they, they kill all the prophets and it's okay, this is a great revival for the nation of Israel. And Elijah races Ahab back. Now Ahab has a, a, a horse and a chariot and Elijah's running. And he wins the race. These are just fascinating miracles all throughout this thing. Elijah gets back. Now Elijah's expectation is revival is going to take over. This is going to be great. If God's people are going to turn back, they're going to embrace God. What a fascinating time this will be. And what does he get back? He gets back and Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. And, and so he goes and he hides. And this is the encounter that we see with God and that Paul cites. Elijah feels alone. But what Elijah hasn't seen is he hasn't seen that God has been at work and he has preserved for himself 7,000 that haven't been to need to pay haven't been to any that, that these are 7,000 of his own people that, that he, Elijah's not even aware of what God's doing. And there are often times when, when we're actively uh, working and looking and, and God, I just don't see what you're doing. Please give me eyes to see it. But God's always at work. Elijah couldn't see what God was doing, but God was working the entire time and preserving his people. There are often times when we are following after God and, and seeking uh, to follow God and, and committing our lives and, and going through and doing everything we do and we get discouraged. God, this doesn't seem to be working. I said, what do you have me, why do you have me doing this? I think of, of Eric who's back who was heading off to, headed off to Guatemala and next week Eric will be up and he's going to tell us about Guatemala. But one of the fascinating things is, is there's a degree of a, a discouragement that mounts and fear and anxiety, the closer you get. And, and these, these things of God, maybe it shouldn't be me, maybe I shouldn't be the one going, maybe, maybe it's not, but, but realistically, God's there. And I have to look at this and think, Elijah was discouraged. It didn't go how he planned. It didn't happen how he thought it was going to happen. There wasn't this grand revival. In fact, he came back and the queen was going to kill him. With the exact opposite of what he thought. Elijah felt discouraged, but many of us feel discouraged at times. But God knows that, God sees that, and God is there and says, don't worry, I'm working out my plan. It's far greater than your plan. As we get on there, there is also, Elijah would have felt alone in the midst of this. This is the whole premise of this conversation with God. He's alone. There's none left. They want to kill me. I'm the last one serving you, God. There's none left, and now they're other after me. But he wasn't alone, was he? 
How often in our walks do we feel alone? One of the things that I, I didn't understand until I actually became a pastor is there is a loneliness that pastors feel. And, and it's a fascinating thing. I don't, don't feel sorry for me. Being a pastor is fantastic. <laughs> Um, I got to tell you, it's it's. Uh, I, I can't see myself doing anything else, which is one of the things in in pastor school they tell you. If you can do anything else, go do it. You don't want to be a pastor if you can do something else. But it's it's one of those things where there's a loneliness because you, you get to the point of where you, you turn and you say, well, who do I complain to? Who do I whine to? I can't whine to my wife because she tells me quit whining. Be the pastor. I can't whine to the the superintendent of the Northern Mountain District because I tried that once and he said, suck it up, you're a pastor. That was those were my words. That was my interpretation. But we really get to this point where, where it feels lonely when you're serving God. But then there are times when, when I stop and I think, wait a minute. I've got a children's director who's serving God diligently. I've got volunteers serving. I've got elders who are serving God. I've got a youth director who's serving God. Does that, uh, celebrate recovery. All these people serving God. I'm not alone at all. I'm surrounded by people who love God who are doing exactly what God has called them. But oftentimes our focus gets so uh, focused in on ourselves and our own loneliness that we don't see God's hand at work. But God's saying, I have a remnant. I preserved them. They're mine, and I'm going to use them as I've designed them to be used. And for at this point, we, we have to look at this and think, well, who in the world are the remnant? I mean, really, we can get this, okay, these are the people following God, but is there something distinguishing about the remnant? And if we, if we turn, if you have your Bibles, I'll read this out, but it's John 15, uh, chapter 15, verses 4 through 11. And this is the Abide in Me passage, and we're going to read this now. I'll read it again later uh, in the sermon as well, towards the closing. But Jesus states, Abide in Me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in Me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. What's fascinating here is, is Jesus is identifying to those who are His disciples, those who are His, those who are called to be His, those who are abiding in Him, they're the ones that are going to bear fruit. Apart from Him, we can't bear any fruit. And how often it is we find ourselves stopping and not listening anymore, not seeing what God's doing, starting to walk away, and, and I, I'd, rather, I'd rather listen to this. Maybe God just doesn't really care about this. I'd rather hear these other stories and these other things, and I'd rather seek after these fleshly things. But God identifies and says, no, abide in me. We speak of the remnant, that's who we're speaking of. This doesn't mean that you don't screw up. God knows I make a mistake every other sentence. But the reality of it is, is we, we can do that, we continue to abide in Christ. We continue to seek Him. We continue in the midst of when we find ourselves uh, committing or engaging in sin, realizing and saying, God, help me. We find ourselves in, in the midst of various trials and turmoils and we, we submit ourselves unto Him and say, God, give me your joy. There's no greater joy than when a Christian is serving God. It's one of the fascinating, it's, it's such a, an interesting dynamic. And I'm not going to encourage you to go and sin. But I've known enough Christians that turn back to sin to know they're some of the most miserable people on the planet because they've had a taste of the truth and they've turned away. But then the most joyous people that I've ever seen are Christians who are abiding. They can have nothing to their name and they abide in Christ and they have this tremendous joy. That's who we're called to be. That's the remnant that we are. And as we press on, we, we come to a, a section where I, I find it's fascinating because it, it actively states that God blinds people. And for many of us, if we look at this, we think, well, that can't be. God certainly wouldn't blind people so that they couldn't follow Him. And it brings to us a challenge. And we think of this, I think of Pharaoh, when God blinded and caused, these, caused Pharaoh's heart to, to be hardened. But there's this dynamic here where we look at this and God actively blinds people. And, and for us, it's tempting to say, that's not true. God would never do such a thing. 
I want you to hear what Jesus, what's stated in John chapter 2, verses 24 to uh, 25. Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Why is that important? If we go back a few weeks and we talked about the sovereignty of God, God understood you were going to turn to him before you ever knew you were going to turn to him. God understood from the beginning of time when he put creation in motion, he said, ah, James, you're mine. Kathy, you're mine. He knew this from the beginning. Why would it be that this would be confusing that God would know who's going to choose him and who's not going to choose him? When we talk about God blinding people, we, we were faced with this notion of God's sovereignty. God knew they weren't going to choose him. God would then allow them to be hardened. And God would, in fact, determine for this to occur and that his purposes would be worked out. And it brings us to this statement. Uh, I've got up here, riddle me this, if it is known by a sovereign God that you will never choose to follow him, is he then incapable of using you to advance his purpose? I you to think of that. I know many people who have chosen, I'm going to deny God, I'm not going to follow him, I don't want anything to do with God, God, you can't have me. Does that make that person incapable of being used by God to benefit those who will be blessed by God? One of the interesting things, and this will drive people nuts if they're a non-believer, and maybe you want to just antagonize them a little. I enjoy doing that, by the way. Somebody who, who says, I don't want to follow your God. I don't have anything to go through all these things. We'll get to some of the, the excuses. They use. I don't want to follow your God. God can't have me. And you sit back and say, really? Is God sovereign? He's going to use you anyways. Well, no, he's not. Yes, he is. And you get into this argument with him, and it's fun because it's kind of childish. But it's okay. It's okay. He's saying, the pastor told me to do this. But, but really, we get into this notion where people think, well, I'm not going to choose this guy. I'm not going to follow God. That doesn't mean God's not going to use you. I told the story of, of uh, uh, somebody who had knocked on our door uh, back in, I think it was June of last year, as Holly and I were praying about some, some decisions we had to make. This person had no idea, and, I, and they weren't a, a follower of Christ, had no idea how God was going to use them. But they, God used them to help us figure out what we were going to do. It's interesting how God does that with people don't even know that they're being used by God to impact the lives of other people. And God still uses them. It's the sovereignty of God at work. And so we look at this in terms of, of if that's true, then if God can use that, and God can use everybody, then ought not man fear God, and when we come before Him, come humbly before Him. This is one powerful God. <clears throat> And there's an argument that I've heard, and I asked the young adults this last week, and, and they hadn't heard this argument, a couple of them there. But I've, I've heard this argument before, uh, people that just, I just don't want to follow God, and they'll throw this argument out, that God is so mean, and I've seen what he did in the Old Testament. And we go back to Joshua, and I love Joshua, because he's throwing, and it's actually hail that he's throwing, I like to say snowballs. But he's throwing hail and he's killing. And you go through the book of Joshua and it goes through these wars and the people of Israel are coming in and they're taking over the land. And God kills more people than the armies of Israel. We have to deal with this. This is our God of love. And we have to deal with this. This is, this is But people will use it. I can't follow a God that would do that. Now I have to look at this and think, you're an idiot. If God can do that, he is a very powerful God. You might want to get in right, get his good graces. Because if he's that mean, and you're seeing this, you're saying, well, this is me. Now, you need to understand God's love to understand what's going on there. But if you look at this, and you just think, this is me. This, this is a very big God. You may want to figure out how to be on his good side. <laughs> now, that's not the end of it with God. We know about God's grace. And I think of this in terms of, of football again. Like I said, I'm the smallest guy. One of the smallest. There's one guy that's smaller than me, and he's smaller than me because he's, he's lighter than me. There are some giant men in Spokane. You may not have known this, but I can attest to there are some giants in Spokane. And when the coach puts me at five foot nothing, 200 and nothing, on the line against a six foot five, 400 pound man, it's not going to go well for me. <laughs> and I have the bruises to prove that it doesn't go well for poor Pastor Steve. I learned quickly to either figure out how to get out of this guy's way or to drop to my knees and beg for mercy. 
And if we look at this in terms of the notion of this is, if this is your view of God, it's just this misinterpretation of the Old Testament. You might want to consider getting on your knees and begging for mercy if that's your view of who God is. Now, we know the reality of it, and if you go back to that, we know that God had offered for these other nations to, uh, to, to allow for it. Because God said, this is Israel's land, I'm giving it to them. And we know that there were, there were tribes, there were groups of people, the, the Gibeonites, who came and they, they were, had peace with Israel. We know Rahab, the prostitute, and her family were saved. Why? Because they made peace with Israel. So we know that this offer of grace was there. So this, this misinterpretation of that, I, I think if you're going to be logically consistent, you're going to say that this is God. It's not a, well, I don't want to believe in him. It's a, holy cow, I'm in trouble. And so we, we have to ask for that logical consistency there. But, but we look at this and we recognize and understand that our God is a God of love. Our God is love. And his compassion upon man, and in his recognizing the sinful nature of man, and recognizing that when we turned away, we we're in trouble. And it's his compassion and his love and his grace where he has been willing to come out of and step out of heaven and hang upon a cross to pay the price for us. This is his grace on display. And this is the God that we serve, and this is the God that we love. This is also the God that, that oftentimes when we speak of, of challenging things, when we talk about God's remnant, this is oftentimes the God that we neglect and we forget. We start to walk away. But as we press on, we come to the next section here. If you have your Bibles, pick them back up and, and we're going to jump through uh, chapter 11, verse 11, down through verse 16. So it's jumping back in at verse 11. So I asked, did they stumble in order to speak of Israel again, that they, they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their tes- trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles and as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order that somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And so we have to look at this in, in terms of of really recognizing, let's be honest, Israel rejecting the Messiah is a bad thing. That's, that's not a good thing, we, but it ends up well for us. It's fantastic. Yay, they rejected him. Because we, what we have to understand there's this whole principle at work that God's dealing with here. And we look at this in terms of the nation of Israel rejected the Messiah, which had to happen, and God had prophesied this through his prophets beforehand that this would happen. And so when we get to this point, we have to look at this and understand that this is a bad event in human history. This is the point at which humanity and God's chosen people said, you know what, we'll do this without you. We're going to take you out. But you can't keep him down. He rose from the dead, resurrected, and then he's ascended to the right hand of God. So we look at this in terms of this is a bad event. But there are great things that happen because of this bad event. And this is how God has utilized them. And if we look at this and understand it, we can see, uh, jumping in in John chapter 4, verses 21 and 22, uh, where Jesus is speaking uh, with the woman at the well. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation, salvation is from the Jews. And what he's speaking of there is, the, if you don't know the encounter, uh, the woman saying, well, the Jews say we have to worship here. Our fathers say we have to worship here. And Jesus says, hey, there's a time coming. When you're not going to worship either one of them. God desires those who worship him in spirit. And that's where we live. That's the time frame we live in is, is Jesus is speaking of, I'm going to pay the price for you and the Holy Spirit is going to dwell within you and you're going to accept me and you're going to be able to worship God wherever you are. And that's, that's what we look at here. But this had to happen in order for this to occur. Christ had to be uh, crucified in order for this to occur. He had to be rejected in order for that. We see also in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16, the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to a house stop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came to him a voice, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. 
And the voice came to him again and said a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once into heaven. What God, what's happening there, this is the inclusion, this is the recognition of the Jews have rejected me. Take the gospel to the Gentiles. This, is, this had to happen, and that's what God is stating here. All throughout the prophecies, we'll see when we get to uh, Romans chapter 15, all throughout the prophecies, there's this recognition of all of the people of the world are going to be blessed because you rejected me. This had to happen. And then finally, we see in, in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, and speaking of Paul, but the Lord said to Anna, 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 Anna go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the, uh, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. What's interesting there? Can you imagine if that's you? This is Paul's introduction, by the way. <laughs> he's, he's knocked off his horse. He's going in. He's heading in. I'm going to kill some Christians. His name's Saul at the time. Jesus knocks him off the horse. Why are you persecuting me? Who are you? It's me, Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And he's blinded. And here you are, and, and you're going about your way, and, and God says, okay, I'm going to bring this guy in who's been killing Christians. And I want you to, to pray for him and bless him and the scales will fall from his eyes and all that. But the introduction for Paul is, I'm going to show you how much you have to suffer for my name's sake. Now, did you think of that when you committed your life to Christ? Here again, this is one of our selling points in the church, by the way. Come to Jesus, we'll show you how much you have to suffer. But that's, the, that's, what, that's Paul's introduction. Hello, Paul. You're going to suffer for me. And he does. And we read through in 2 Corinthians. Paul goes through his resume. Shipwrecked, beaten, all these things that are going on in his life. And he's really suffering. But he's taking the gospel to the, the Gentiles. That's his purpose. That's his intention. That's how God had designed him. He was a remnant. He was a, a, a carpet sitting in the, in the remnant store. And God said, that's the one I'm going to because this is the purpose I have for it. That's fascinating. I am so glad that when I came to Christ, God said, Steve, I love you. You don't have to suffer at all. He didn't say that. In my head, that's sometimes what I think I heard. Because God, why is there not sunshine and, and it's not raining gumdrops? Because that's not life, Steve. There will be a time you'll be with me in heaven. We'll be uh, set my kingdom up upon the earth. And this will be, it'll be great. For now, understand you're a sojourner and it's in a different land. And oftentimes we forget that. And these, these concepts of these things of, of being enticed away and, and, and I don't need to listen to God. I don't need to see God. I don't need to, to he doesn't care about these things. All these things, because we've lived this, it becomes enticing. I find it fascinating that in the midst of, of the rejection of the Messiah, great things are happening, and God had intended for this to occur. And Paul goes on, and, and, and we recognize, I don't know if you know this, but there is a, a method for how the gospel was delivered. And, and it was always delivered first to the Jews. And, and even when Paul would go into the, the new cities, where would he go? He'd go to the Jews first. And they beat him and, and beat him up and then they tried to throw him in jail and then he'd go to the Gentiles. That's the, well, that's the way this would work. Jesus said to his, his disciples in Matthew 10, uh, the 12 that Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And later on in chapter 15, when uh, he has this in encounter with the Canaanite woman, uh, she says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word, and his disciples came and begged him, and saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, and saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Amen. Then Jesus answered, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Jesus was sent specifically to the nation of Israel. And this is an important thing for Christians to grasp. Because oftentimes we, we don't get the history and understanding. Because were this was what the prophecies foretold. He's going to come and they're going to reject him. And this is how we get brought in. That's an important piece of Christian history that we have to bear in mind. That doesn't mean that Israel's done. And we'll talk about that in a second. 
But it's, it's fascinating to me because then there's, there's an intentional format for this. God had this purpose, and we see this, and we'll get into more detail of this when we get into chapter 15 of Romans. But Paul states, Therefore welcome one another as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God in his mercy. So he was first sent to them in order that they would reject him, that we could embrace him. And that's the method that's always been used. That's, that's fascinating to me. Because God's people reject, but there was still a remnant. You realize the disciples were Jews. And, and many of the people, we all as we've gone through the book of Romans, Paul's talking to two different people groups. It's the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And this is who he's talking about in, the, in this church in Rome. And so we have to look at this. And then Paul does something fascinating. As he talks about the reality of if the Jews' rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what possibly could be accomplished if they accept him? And that's fascinating because we have to deal with this. There's this. I call it a paradigm shift, but if we look at chapter in verse 15, that's what it says specifically. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what would their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Now we could rule this a couple different ways. Perhaps this is just conjecture on Paul's part. Maybe he's just saying this. Let's just hypothetically think and theoretically consider what if the Jews accepted Christ? How much greater would that be? And we might be tempted to go that route, but that's not accurately. I don't believe that's what Paul's doing. You see, realistically, there's a subtle eschatological underpinning in what Paul's saying. We'll go into more detail uh, next week as we consider this because it paired up with later uh, statements in chapter 11. But what this does provide for us is to know that Paul is establishing here the notion that God's not done with Israel. It's tempting for us, and, and, and throughout history, many churches and many Christians have done this to state that the church has become Israel. No, no, no. Israel's Israel. We're the body of Christ. God's not done with Israel. They have important things when we talk about eschatology and when we look at the prophecies specific to the nation of Israel. And so we look at this in terms of their, the rejection of Christ uh, by the nation of Israel does not eliminate nor does it remove the promises God made to them and their fathers. Her rejection was necessary for the grace to abound to the world, but that does not equate to her being lost for good. Israel is still God's chosen people. Through him his Messiah has come and through whom salvation has come. And I say this because if you were with us several weeks ago, we talked about the church has a nasty history of anti-Semitism. And not, not necessarily crossroads, by the way. When I say things like that, I mean the church global, the church universal, both, uh, both Catholicism as well as Protestantism. It, it drips out of our history, and we have to really face that and recognize it. That's not mentioned in the New Testament. You can't get there by looking at the New Testament. But it's there, and, and it's this philosophy there. So it does us well to understand God is working with us. So that's why the things that, that are going on in the Middle East are fascinating. When you look at do you know how big Israel is? Israel is tiny. You know how much problems the world faces because of Israel? That's where everybody's focus is on this one little tiny area of the world. Why? There's a lot of big things going to happen there. And Satan knows it. So what's he going to do? He's going to attack it. It's fascinating. These, these, are, these are wonderful things when we grasp this and recognize it. But we get to the, the, the next section where we kind of, we're going to complete here in, in jumping back in in chapter 11, verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in, speaking now to the Gentiles, among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember that it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, 
and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, one of the things that you can grasp from this, and that is important for us to understand, is they were really into horticulture. That's, that's the Monday morning joke. <laughs> Apparently, horticulture and all of that is important. Now, thank God I took a horticulture class in the, in the 12th grade. And of high school, that's one of the only classes I took it because it would be an easy grade. I found out that the wood shop was not so easy for me. Horticulture, however, was great. And I learned what grafting things in were. And I didn't realize at the time that God was preparing me to be a pastor so I could talk about grafting things in. Because the, apparently the Israelites, the Jews, and the, the Romans at that time, they were really into horticulture. And so they understood all of this, and we have to make sense of this. There are, there are three things that God's talking about here. One is the broken branches that God breaks up. Two is the grafted branches in. And three is the root. And so we have to make sense of who these people are. The branches that were cut off, I think it's easy for us to see, is many of the Israelites. What's important to note is Paul states that not all of them are broken off. Only some of them. And why were they broken off? Because of their unbelief. It was their unbelief that caused God to say, I've got to break them off and I've got to graft in new branches. And then the branches that were grafted in are the, the Gentiles. But what's, I mean, let me pause here for a moment with, with this grafting of branches in. Because I'm going I'm to state something for a second here. What's interesting, if, if we go back, all of the evidence is there. So what's different between those who are grafted in, or those who, who remained, and then those who were broken off? It's this belief. I can look at the evidence, I can believe God, and I can accept what he's saying. I had a circumstance in my life where I was sitting um, on base one day, and Bill Deller was there, and, and the former pastor of, of this church uh, was there, and he's the, the wing chaplain. And at the time, we were, we were talking with a woman who was dying. Uh, she was one of our co-workers, and he had good friends with us. She had been diagnosed with cancer. We didn't know she only had about another month to live. Uh, but she was there, and from the month we'd seen her prior to that current month, it looked bad. And we knew it was a short time. And this pastor witnessed to her to such an extent that I remember sitting there listening and thinking, boy, I want to give my life to Christ again. And I'll never forget, she said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. You can have your faith, and I'll have mine. I don't believe it. And then within, I, I don't know exactly the length of time, but it was shortly after that she died. And, and I remember sitting there hearing the information and, and listening and not only knowing that it was true, because I, but, but listening to this and recognizing, how can you not get it? And it's this willful <coughs> ignorance or this willful desire, I'm not going to accept it. Paul writes of this in 2 Corinthians, we speak of a veil. Their minds were hardened for to this day when they read the Old Covenant. Uh, that, veil same, that veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their eyes, over their hearts, I'm sorry. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And Paul is speaking of, of this reference with Moses and a veil. We can go back to Exodus. And Moses came down from Mount Sinai and two tablets of the testimony in his hand. And he came down. Moses didn't know that his face was shining. That's fascinating too, by the way. Moses comes down, got a shiny face, like a light bulb. That's your face. But, so he goes off, he tells people, uh, Moses doesn't know that, goes off, calls them in, Aaron and the leaders of the congregation returned to him, Moses talks with them, afterwards all the people came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord spoke to him on Mount Sinai. When he finished speaking with him, he put a, bit, a veil over his face. When Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would, he would remove the veil. When he came out, and he told the people of Israel what he commanded, now Moses, they would, people of Israel would see his face, and that his skin was shining, and then he would put the veil over his face again after he had already communicated what God had said. Now, the, the reality is this is a reference that God is not being heard or seen. So why would Moses take the veil? So I could properly see God and also so that I could communicate to God's people what God is saying. Now put the veil back over. What happens? The veil obstructs what you're going to see. And oftentimes we're, we encounter people like that in our lives. And when we speak here of the, the nation of Israel, we speak of those who have been broken off, those broken branches, that's what's happening. Is the evidence is there. Everything's, everything's right there. But I don't want to see it. I can't see it, and I'm not willing to see it. And so that brings us into the branches that are grafted in, which is us. You might be tempted. I know many of you think this when you think of me. Praise God, we have Steve on our side. <laughs> That's what I told God when I committed my life to Him. God, you know how lucky you are to have me. 
The team is now stacked in your favor. I know it was tough up to this point, but lucky you, God, you've got me. And that's about the time when my wife looked at me and said, I'm moving away because you're about to get hit. <laughs> Oftentimes, it's very tempting for us to think, God, how lucky you are. Now, most of us at Crossroads would not say this, except me. I know what God will give me. God always has this way of proving to me I'm not that important. But what's interesting is really we start to recognize this, that our being grafted in is based not on us, based in our faithfulness and based in our belief in God and, and, and putting faith in what He has done. It has nothing to do with me. All I did was look at the evidence and said, I'm in trouble. i got to get this thing right. This sin is killing me. And it's destroying everything. i, I got to do something about this. And there's nothing I can do because I can't stop doing it. And God says, that's why I'm here. And that's the, the reality of it. For, so for us, we, we have to look at this and, and understand that Faithfulness and belief in God's grace and mercy, it is His faithfulness through His provision of His Son that it allows us to fight the temptation of becoming arrogant. And so for us, we, it does us right to, to, to remember we're grafted into this root and it's not us. that we, we aren't the nation of Israel by, by any means, but at the same time, we are grafted in. But who does the grafting? The gardener. The gardener is the one that looks and says, I know how I want this, how I desire for this plant. If you never graft uh, anything in, you, you take it, I think there's a picture up here, you cut the, the tree and you, you cut it and you graft in the branch and you tape it up and you do this and then it becomes a part of that tree and it draws its nutrients from the root. And that's what we are. We, we really, uh, the, the root provides for us the nourishment that we need to thrive. And that brings me back to John chapter 4. I'm sorry, John chapter 15. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. What's fascinating for me is, is really this thought of I'm a branch not because of the greatness of who I am. I'm a branch because God said you're mine. I'm a branch, I'm, I'm grafted in, not because of, of the wonderful things that, that God will do for me and through me and all that. God says, Steve, you're an idiot, but I'm going to use you. <laughs> and so I go, oh, thanks, God, I appreciate that. Not only that, I'm going to show you how much you have to suffer for my name's sake. No thanks. But we look at this and he's grafted us in and he puts us in there and we draw our nutrients from him. And what is our purpose? To bear fruit. To bear fruit. The whole purpose of the remnant. The whole purpose of us being left, the whole purpose of us is, is the, the ones that have been cut out is to bear fruit. Life is very simple when we break it down to what's the purpose that I have. If I'm part of the of Jesus Christ, if I'm part of that, if that's me, my entire purpose is to bear fruit for God. Have you ever thought of that, saints? But don't think of that as oftentimes when people will look at that and say, oh man, I want a new car. I want this, I want that, I want this, these other things. This looks like it's more fun. Your thought, the creator of the universe, could do anything he wants, by the way, chose you to bear fruit. That's, there's nothing greater in the entirety of these. I, if you look at the stars, this is magnificent. And you look at how the magnitude and the, the size of the cosmos, and then you tear, turn that around and you look at the, the size and the, and the design behind things at the, the, at the molecular level, and you look at this. It's fascinating how God has done all this. This is the God that spoke all this into existence says, I want to use you. I want you to abide in me so you can bear fruit. How simple that makes it for us. And how these, often these distractions that get in our way... <coughs> These things, I don't want to hear God. I don't want to see God. I, I, maybe He doesn't care. God cares. And, and perhaps maybe, maybe realistically, uh, I should, you should, we should be following these other things and doing these other things. God says, no. Your purpose is to bear fruit. And that's, that's a, a glorious honor that we have. But I look at this in terms of, I will relate this. I, I do think, and, and I, I hope that I'm wrong. I think we're in, in the midst of a crisis in our culture. Um, I, I, you know, it's been one that I think has been brewing for, you know, several decades. 
I think we, we, we find ourselves in the midst of not only moral turpitude and, and various things, and, and regardless of what you think of the finances of it, I, I don't know how, I, I can't fathom you know, $17 trillion. That's a lot of money. And I, there's a point at which you just say, ah, who knows? But really, when we look at this in terms of a dying culture, I'm more concerned of what's going on within the churches. What's going on with, do you realize when, when God talks about there's a restraining force? It's the Holy Spirit in the world, and that gets removed. That's when we talk about the rapture, the Holy Spirit's room. Do you know where he dwells? In the hearts of the believers. That's us. Saints, you're the remnant. You're plan A. There's no plan B. You're the varsity guy. And you might be tiny. And you might be lined up against a 400-pound lineman. That's your job. And you smile. And you fall down. <laughs> God, help! But that's it. So I, I ask these questions, and, and really, what, is, what God's calling on us to do is fairly simple. Live it out. Live it out. <clears throat> Abide in Christ and live out our faith. It's, it's not, you know, there, there are a lot of times when, when pastors were very tempted to go into, well, this is how you live out your faith. It's really... Live it. Allow God to live through you. Center your world around Him. Center your families, husbands and fathers in your, in your lives. Center your family. You're the spiritual, you're the one that God has designed. There's a design behind how God has put family. And you're the one that God says, this is your responsibility. Don't abscond from your responsibility. Embrace it. God has called you to a mighty position. Wives and mothers, if, if you're, if you're a, there we, a single mothers, there are, there are wives who, whose husbands aren't believers, you have a responsibility. Live out your faith. If you want war stories, you can ask my wife of what it's like to live with a husband who's not a follower of Christ. For several years of our marriage, that was us. And it was painful for her. It was a blur for me. I had a great time. I don't know when she has all these horrors. What are you talking about? I was, I was there. I don't remember that. And then it's, that's the problem. You don't remember that. But really, that's, we look at this in terms of the simplicity of this for us is it comes back to that. You want to bear fruit, abide in Christ, and live for Him. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, Lord, oh, what a gift it is You've given us to serve You. So what an honor it is that you've chosen us as your instruments. Lord, as I, as I consider just the depth of the statement for Paul of how he would suffer. But Lord, even, even in this, in the midst of, of what we perceive as, as oftentimes as suffering for you, Lord, you're right there. And, and Father, I think of my life and the lives of others who have, in the midst of, of suffering is when we feel the closest to you. God, I pray that each of us would be bold in the midst of this time and in our culture and in our, in our history and, and in our lives and in our families' lives <coughs> that we would be the ones that you refer to as the remnant, that we would abide in you, submitting ourselves. <coughs> and Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.